you, you, you are now about to witness the strength of street knowledge. Let's discover hard couple months, but it's this, this, this is enough so you can know what's up in the hood. Well, the vision of the restaurant is to open up different concepts to our communities where they need it the most. So we realized in the inner cities of Chicago that there's a shortage of healthier concepts, so we decided to open up a healthier concept in this community in West Humble Park. The connection to food and culture is the thought process of when you eat better, you do better. Meaning that if you're eating healthier foods, then you may think different and make better decisions. So it can impact the culture and the environment that you live in. <laughs> what dish are you making for us today? Some country pork ribs. Um, it's a South Carolina dish. Um, you actually just wash your country pork ribs off in the sink. After you wash them off, Get you some seasoning, garlic powder, onion powder, seasoning salt. Everything is done cooking. I have my little sauce made up and I dip them in the sauce and maybe put them back on the grill. Sometime I might put them in here, put this back on the grill and simmer. Yeah, I learned from my father. When I was a little younger, he used to, he used to teach me how to cook, so I just used to watch him and learn from him how he was cooking. My name is Musa Yala and I work at La Pragma, which is a Puerto Rican restaurant, a Bolico restaurant. We also have a mixture of culture in our store. Here yeah, a lot of people look forward to a lot of veggie, a lot of the carne guisa, the soup. A lot of people walk in here for a lot of things they look forward to that they don't get in their hometown in Puerto Rico. It's nothing going to be the same. Um, everybody got different ways of cooking. Here we do a lot that we don't do in our hometown. Here we get a variety. We don't get that in our hometown in Puerto Rico. It's not how it's made differently, it's how the people make it. Everybody got different ways of making it, different seasonings. Puerto Rico, we use a lot of homegrown. Everything comes like fresh from the ground. All that grows, and we, you know, we live off of that in Puerto Rico. Puerto oh, Rican food is awesome. I love my rice with pigeon peas and uh, pork on the side. Uh, you gotta have your sweet plantains. Awesome with sweet plantains. Uh, Dumplings are also well, uh, known as alcapurias. Um, come visit the Palma whenever you guys get a chance. Awesome food here, awesome environment, and uh, love the employees, especially the lady, the lady that was on here earlier. She's really famous. Basically, because it reminds me of mine. Um, normally, that's how we were raised. We were raised on making these traditional dishes just to remind us about, I guess, who we are, where we come from. So that's normally why, I mean, and it's like a routine. And we make it every day, it's either yellow or white. We use, normally I think the popular one is Goya. This is what they use, the Goya adobo. I use this one because it's less salt. This is the third part of preparing the Ibaritos. Now we're down to smashing them and refining them again into their golden brown. As we all know, there are different genres of music. Rap, R&B, pop rock, and even more. But most of this music is played as mainstream. 
For those who do not know what mainstream music is, mainstream music is music that you hear mainly every day, either on the radio or someone's phone or a music device. What if I told you that there is other music out there with the same genres, but it's called underground? Would you be interested? For those who do not know what underground music is, underground music is a term that has been applied to various artistic movements, but recently has been defined by, by musicians who avoid being trapped by the music industry, or music that is heard by producers but is not brought to the radio because the producers choose what the people of today want to hear. Do you think that's unfair for those who are trying to make it? Underground music is also defined as an unknown music culture, and most people prefer to listen to underground music other than mainstream. Which goes to ask, which do you prefer, mainstream or underground, and why? Also goes to ask, why isn't underground played on a daily basis? My name's Avery Farmer. Uh, I'm a hip-hop artist. Uh, I love music. It's the best thing I felt. I guess man could have ever brought into this world in a sense, so yeah, I love music. Uh, my name is Nick Rowley. Uh, I work here at Care Top Distribution or Saki Records. My name is Robin Lega. Juwan Sterling, I go by uh, Juju, Double Ju. Um, my name is Jesse De La Pena. I'm here from Chicago. Uh, I work in music. Uh, I've been involved in DJing for over 25 years and I currently work for a small radio station here in Chicago called Vocalo Radio. I'm the music curator and I host and produce a six-hour DJ show on Friday nights. Uh, my name is Maceo Vidal Hames and I'm a musician. My name is Nicholas Hennessy. I'm a musician also. We're both from the Omis. Big Baby with double G's. My name is Anthony Dean. Yeah, Chicago's favorite nerdy, Y.G. When I think about the term of underground music, it reminds me of, or helps me think like, it's music that's being unappreciated, music that's being undermined, that's not given the light that it's supposed to be given. Think about bands that are kind of trying to find their way of finding fans and getting their music out to people without necessarily the help of a big major label or corporate money. Think of indie music that is more emotional. It seems like it's kind of changed the definition of what that means over the years. I mean, back when, maybe in the 90s, you know, there was underground house music, underground hip hop. I think it was, it was stuff that wasn't that accessible, uh, stuff that wasn't necessarily being played on commercial radio. Uh, maybe it was being played on uh, college radio. And it was just kind of not in, you know, everybody's kind of immediate grasp. You had to kind of uh, search for it a little bit. It's very different today now that we've got the internet because people are able to find out about your music much easier than they were, say, 20 years ago if you're just a small band from a smaller town, not New York or L.A. Music that isn't being um, promoted as well or funded by, by the mainstream, uh, you know, record companies and all that, people who are doing it on their own. Not less fortunate, but artists who don't get as much attention as mainstream artists. Bands that are out touring constantly, uh, self-promoting. Yeah, I, I think it's just kind of like got a good DIY attitude to it. I mean oftentimes the like the beginning of what ends up being mainstream music once they buy it out. Um, you know the origins of hip-hop and everything else all started off as underground things and you know then then corporations came through and co-opted them but you know it's the root of you know, most music. Real, it's raw, it's rough. Like, it's, you know, it's, it's somebody hungry, somebody thirsty to, to get to that, that mainstream level. It's uh, rappers from, from the streets uh, making music, not like people signing to labels and stuff. People who grind, I don't know, cause, I, cause I'm an underground, I do underground music too. So and I, a lot of people I know who, that do underground music is, uh, <laughs> they mostly grind it hard.
think mainstream music is played more than underground music because there's more hype to the music, there's more well-known artists. Simply put, because they're feeding what the people want here. Mainstream is being known by more radio stations because it's more into the music industry uh, rather than underground. Mainstream music is played f more often than underground music for a lot of reasons. Um, most of them having to do with money. Um, you know, who's funding um, your distribution and how your music gets out there. Um, you know, whether or not you're actually connected with like uh, Clear Channel or other things like that which pretty much decide every single song that's on the radio. So if you're listening to the radio and you hear the same song in every single radio station, it's because they're all owned by the same people. Um, there's a lot of big money behind it. Uh, record labels, um, marketing, a lot of different um, avenues to really get the word out when it comes to certain music. Um, I mean, you could explore payola and kind of that aspect of it that's kind of been going on for many years. But, I mean, I just think there's a lot of money behind uh, mainstream music, and it's a big investment. And, you know, uh, underground music, it's more do-it-yourself, and it's small labels. So they don't have the resources, I think, a lot of uh, major labels or more mainstream music does. Uh, for you to be, like, number one on a billboard chart, uh, you used to have to sell millions of records, and I think now you can sell, like, half a million records or something like that. Um, so the margin is kind of shrinking a little bit between the two, but again, I would say it's just corporate money, having managers who can get you involved with really big things. So you may have a program director in a certain market who kind of oversees you know, what is played, but I think it, different individual markets, you're probably dealing with a program director, a PD, or um, someone like myself. I'm a music curator, but I don't work for a commercial radio station. So I have a lot more freedom to play what I want to play. I don't have really an agenda or I don't really have anybody saying, you must play this or you must feature this thing. We're kind of left to our own. Uh, it's kind of a trade-off because we do a lot of things since we're a small station, but we get a lot of freedom too. The shows tend to be a little bit more intimate. If you go see, you know, someone who, like Lady Gaga, who's a huge mainstream artist, you're gonna see her with thousands and thousands of fans. Where, as with a more underground band, you can go see them live in an intimate setting with maybe only a hundred, two hundred people. So you feel a lot more connected to the music. It's a little bit more personal. Love, say love. love. One more time, love. love. All right. Say sweet. sweet. Say what sweet? sweet. It is what it is. Music is a cycle. You know, everybody starts off hungry, and then you know you start getting money, and then the music changes. So I mean, that's just how it, that's how it goes. That's how it's gonna be. Uh, the difference I would say between mainstream and underground is uh, probably money. I think that's probably where it is. Anybody who isn't in the mainstream or on the radio and makes music is an underground artist, and that is a huge community in every city, in every country, in the entire world. There's a lot of musicians that aren't on the radio, so. Actually, probably underground music has more listeners, more artists, more followers, but just not the money behind it, not the radio stations behind it. It's more real. 
would all instantly prefer underground music. Well, I personally prefer underground music, I suppose, to mainstream. There, part of it is there's a joy and kind of self-discovery with a lot of that t style. I prefer mainstream uh, over underground because I don't really know that much of underground because it is, I don't, I don't get to hear that much of it. I'm like mainstream where I, if I listen to the radio, I'm gonna hear. I prefer underground music because it's more unique and less produced and commercial. I prefer underground music because I don't like listening to music that gets played out like quickly. And I think there's a lot of undiscovered talent out there that people aren't aware of. It really don't matter to me, but I say underground because of where I came from. Uh, I prefer good music, whatever it is, you know. I mean, yeah. some, some of mainstream music is really bad and some underground music is really bad. Um, a lot more of the mainstream music is bad, by, you know, by percentage wise, but I th feel like um, if the music is good, period, uh, it's worth listening to. I just think good music is good music. Um, sometimes it's something that's on a major label and maybe a lot of people know about it. I, I, I tend to gravitate probably towards more lesser known stuff, so more underground. But I listen to a little bit of everything since I do work in radio. And I do find stuff that maybe is a B-side cut or maybe there's something on an album that's not gonna be played um, as a single and it could be considered, you know, more mainstream, but probably prefer more the uh, unknown stuff, more the underground stuff, most of the time. Music is so, um, it, it, it's so much opinionated based on what, I mean, I probably, I would say I don't like music that sounds like garbage, but you could maybe listen to one of my records that I enjoy and be like, ooh, that is a stinker. Anytime you're dealing with music or older, newer, younger, older, um, there's going to be always so many different opinions on, you know, what people like, and everybody's entitled to their own, you know, what they they're into, what they dig. I would say just be more open-minded to other types of music. Um, there may come something that you, you know, an artist you really like and you buy the album because that re record gets played all the time. You may experiment with the album he uh, did before or she did before and hear something like, wow, I didn't even think I liked this type of music. So there's always, you know, more to, to that. And, and like I, even just thinking about certain artists you like, they obviously got inspired by somebody else too. So. They could always turn you on to a whole other, you know, stream of music or, or uh, creativity that you had no idea that they were into, you know. So it's kind of like just be a little more open-minded when it comes to stuff like this. I mean, you know, older folks, you know, don't just write off the youth and younger folks, you know, do your homework. Figure out where this stuff came from. Uh... Performing is, it's fun. Uh, it's a whole different experience than like, you know, recording in a studio or anything like that because, you know, the vibe is that you're giving off energy and receiving energy and trying to give it back from, you know, a crowd, especially with a band, like us sort of all working together um, and knowing where we are in, in a song or a, uh, you know, a set list, um, you know, being hyper conscious of each other and where we're at. Um, and then also having fun, because if you're not having fun, then it's going to show. <laughs> it's instant gratification, which a lot of uh, artists of different media, like mediums, a lot of, you know, if you paint a painting, you might never get to hear what a room of 200 people felt about that painting your entire life. But if I've always known I was different. I've never exactly fit in. Is it the clothes I wear? Been this way all my life. If I were to compare myself to something, it would be art. Weird and different like me. Art is not just pen and pencil, mindless lines and strokes. Art is an expression, feeling and emotion. The Cloud Gate downtown was a British sculpture and East Kapoor's first outdoor piece. It was meant to mirror the Chicago skylines and was shockingly inspired by liquid mercury. 
I was looking at the cloud gate one day, like I do every Tuesday, and I met someone. I don't know, but I call him Bark. After that, we kind of started touring the city together. Just a couple of steps away was Crown Fountain, so we decided to go. Crown Fountain is a great example of interactive art and fits into an uncommon category of video sculpture. Jaume Plenza has promoted interactions between people and water, distinguishing Crown Fountain from Chicago's and many other fountains. Plenza had been working with dualism for a long time, but he had also wanted to introduce the use of video technology, seen in some of his previous pieces. With doing so, he had hoped to overcome the obstacles of creating an interactive relationship between the viewers and the art and was amazed to discover he had achieved that when it became a public water park for children within the hours of opening. Our last destination was a sculpture on the Bloomingdale Trail called Brick House. It was completely made out of recycled rubber tires and stainless steel. Its creator, Chikaya Booker, meant to combine ecological concerns with racial and economic differences, globalization, and gender. While we were at Brick House, Bark noticed something sticking out from within a spiral. It was a person. It also shared the same passion Bark and I have for art, so it joined us. Now that I think about it, I may not be as alone as I thought I was. I mean, even the creators of the public art piece I mentioned earlier experience a lot of judgment concerning their work, so maybe I'm simply looking at the downside of things. After going to several public exhibits, I've met people who like me for me. I guess we're all a little different. There are a lot of people around the city who hope to share their aspirations who are not known to many, and despite that, they still aim to create their art. Uh, my dad was really talented. Um, he used to paint motorcycles, and he kind of like instilled this whole like, uh, like be a good draftsman, good work, like things need to make sense, like, um, and that kind of just like radiated, and I kind of pursued it from there and kept drawing and kept working and went to school, and then from there, uh, I actually started working at ASM as an intern, and then my career kind of just went from there. Uh, I guess uh, I got involved in art uh, early on, uh, being uh, poor as hell in the hood uh, with nothing, and you had to like just you know crayons and paint and markers, and and you just express yourself on the street, and uh, um, that's how I, it wasn't art; it was just expression. You know, I didn't know it was art until someone told me it was art. Man. <laughs> um, I, you know, it breaks down to like designers, they design buildings, there's murals, there's color, there's like all these things that maybe you don't think about every day, but all these things are thought out and they're usually behind it is a creative person. And it's just me as a creative person, I would want to see more of that and more and like more people to be excited about it or like community projects or things that just sort of bring people together. And then you look and you're like, wow, that's nice. It's, uh, it's great to see something that kind of inspires people to be like, man, I could probably do something like that. I think Chicago is my most influence. This is the city where I live. This is the city where I play. This is the city where uh, I laugh and cry. Um, um, it, it, a lot of my artwork is a representation, is a uh, expression of, of how I live in the city. So I think the city is a big part of, of, of my art. It's, it's a way to give back to it and it's a way to um, uh, to describe to other people how I see my city. A combination between my brain and my heart. It's about the passion that I'm uh, a part of and it's about the, the, the thought process that got me my passion. It's about melding um, what I think is important to what I feel needs to be said. As important as it is, it seems like it's always an afterthought, but almost everything revolves around it the chair I'm sitting in, this building, you know, the colors that they picked on the walls. Like, it's all somebody going like, ooh, this could look nice if we did this. And um, I just wish that more people were into it the way that I feel about it, but it's hard to sort of project that. And when actually making the actual piece of art isn't the hard part, the hard part is getting started, like figuring out the direction, figuring out like 
um, the message that you're trying to convey or the vibe, um, those are the, like, that's the most time consuming part. Like actually doing the work or putting the mural up is the easiest part because you're just not even thinking. You're just putting things together. Uh, don't be afraid. I think that's one of the hardest things to uh, overcome. And it's, and it's, it's fear of, of success and it's fear of failure and it's a fear of, of belonging. And, and all those things are, are ways, art, art helps you develop those things where you can get comfortable with them. Um, I think young people at the same time have a fearlessness about the city, but they have a fear about the future. Um, and I think art can bridge that. And you just decide like, all right, how can I make this even weirder or more fun and then build off of it and then other people see it and they're like, okay, like there's a little bit of versatility and personality and things that you can kind of um, use to add to the whole overall character itself. And um, yeah, um, basically I took it as one thing at a time and one bridge at a time and just tried to figure out like, what can I do next? How can I sort of pursue this? Or how could I help somebody out? Or I would put myself out there and it was all just um, the people from the city and I couldn't be happier to be here and work with like people who've done art, like Chicago Public Art Group or like they would show me little things and I feel like I learned more being in the city around people than I did when I went to school for it. So if anything, that would probably be what sort of had a lasting effect on me. So create your art, whether it's dancing, singing, painting, or sculpting, as long as you're doing what you want to do. I am the best dressed, but I have a relentless drive for progress, so look at me and make progress. Oh. I'm kind of hungry, but if you look at me, we need unity. This country's falling apart.